Welcome back to Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. I'm personal financial planner, columnist, and financial therapist, Rick Kaler. Research tells us that 90% of all financial decisions are made emotionally, not logically. For nearly four decades, I've been helping people make better money decisions. So what makes my financial worldview different from most financial experts? I blend the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Good money decisions are not just about the money. So let's get started with today's episode. Welcome back to another edition. Uh, Very glad to have you with us. We've been talking about um, what to do when we meet resistance. And last week, we hit some of those same ideas, but more from a, a point of giving advice and why while why giving advice can be pretty uh, problematic and we covered uh, three reasons why it's best to avoid uh, giving advice especially unsolicited advice um today i want to follow up on what i said last time that i wanted to get into which are the 12 roadblocks to providing advice, um, which are given to us by a gentleman, Thomas Gordon. He's a psychologist and an educator. Uh, we refer to these in our early work. Um, Ted Klotz coined the phrase, the dirty dozen. Um, at a later date, we laid, labeled them 12 guaranteed ways. And there's something that I feature and go over in the uh, graduate course that I teach at Golden Gate University. <clears throat> and I just want to say on my really good days, I try to avoid these roadblocks. Um, and oftentimes when we're teaching them or giving them out up front, we don't call them <clears throat> roadblocks. <coughs> um, I think the most interesting thing is uh, the 12 guaranteed ways. And sometimes um, I almost always have one student that gets through the entire teaching and decides that, yeah, these these are guaranteed ways, guaranteed to help people change. And here's the ones I really like. And I just want to tell you up front that that isn't the point. (laughs) These are things to avoid, um, very similar to the uh, method of, of love and logic, which was written for parents in communicating with children. Here are the roadblocks. The first one is ordering, directing, or commanding. Now, this is telling somebody what to do. I think this is pretty obvious that it is um, one of the worst ways to help someone change. Um, Typically, ordering, directing, or commanding somebody is usually going to put them immediately on the defensive. It might work okay in the military, but it doesn't work okay with friends or clients. It can evoke a lot of emotions within a person. The uh, listener can be feeling really controlled over being told what to do, feel angry, or uh, if they're an Enneagram type one like myself, feel a lot of resentment. I think we've covered this uh, pretty well in our past couple of podcasts, that telling people what to do just doesn't work well. The second one is warning, threatening, or admonishing. So this is telling somebody exactly what's going to happen to you if you don't do what I want. That, oh, you know, when we put them this way, they just sound like, who would do that? Um, But I think we do it all the time. As a financial planner, you can warn somebody by saying, if, uh, if you don't start funding your retirement plan, you're going to be 
a bank lady. Um, or you're going to be a homeless guy. I don't mean to be uh, sexist with those statements. Or you threaten them. Um, if you don't file your taxes, you're going to end up in jail. Um, this, uh, this can be motivation by fear. Um, and it's used a lot by a lot of professionals. But it is not the best way to really help somebody take action. The emotions that can come up for the person are feeling fear. Uh, they can feel intimidated. They can feel um, spoken down to, you know, maybe minimized, patronized. I don't know if feeling patronized is a, a feeling, but uh, certainly there can be a feeling of uh, anger. And of course, this can bring up resistance, which we talked about a couple of podcasts ago, that um, can stop a person just uh, in their tracks from taking any type of, uh, or making any type of behavior change. Sure, maybe they'll comply. Maybe they'll be so scared they'll comply that time. But it's not a, a real sustainable environment that is going to help somebody uh, get to the place where they take that action on their own because they can see it's a good action. And it doesn't mean that the, the warning isn't right. It doesn't mean that the advice being dispensed in a threatening mode isn't right. It's the manner in which it's delivered that can almost make a person less likely to take that action. Moralizing, the third one is moralizing, preaching, or using shoulds and oughts. So this is just simply telling somebody what they should do. You shouldn't do this. Preaching, certainly in that era that I was raised in the church, was full of shoulds and oughts. If you're a good person, this is what you should be doing. This is what you ought to be doing. And again, this can move somebody further away. All of these roadblocks are things that can move a person further away from enacting the change that the changer <laughs> would like to see. So a person to, with this can feel judged can really feel criticized and controlled. And we've talked about this in the podcast before that anytime we use an ought or a should or on ourselves or we uh, use an ought or a should on someone else, we really need to pause because oughting and shoulding, whether it's ourselves or another person, is not something that is going to get deep change. It's shaming. It can be received as shaming. The fourth one is advising, giving solutions, or suggesting. Hmm. Now we talked about advising a lot in the last podcast. Giving solutions, especially when they are unsolicited. And if you begin to listen to people around you, you're going to hear more and more unsolicited advice. It's kind of rampant. Now, sometimes we like to give advice by suggesting, you know, I'm suggesting that you go down and do this, or I'm suggesting that you follow this course of action. You know, it's kind of close to number one, which would be ordering. It sounds a little bit, a little bit, lighter. Uh, but it's still giving advice. And we talked about last time that oftentimes if we can give options, again, when asked for advice, not one course, but two or three courses of action that are possible courses, are courses of action others have taken in somewhat similar situations. And then always saying, but it may not be right for you. This may not be right for you. In so many words, you're free to do whatever you think 
is important for you. And that can grade on a financial advisor. I mean, can you imagine saying, well, I really suggest you file your taxes. Well, yeah, (laughs) that's probably a good thing to do, right? But the person, when you think about it, not filing taxes is an option. And it's oftentimes, it's the very thing that, that we don't want the other person to do is the thing that we often won't mention. And so it can set up this resistance that we talked about a few podcasts ago. Until that is brought out and acknowledged as a path they can take, that they are free to take, there can be that inner struggle to follow the advice when they immediately know, well, an option is you don't, you don't have to file taxes. Now, you could give them some knowledge, but the knowledge needs to be fair and balanced. Even not filing your taxes may not mean you go to jail, especially if there's no taxes to pay. It may mean that you have some penalties to pay uh, or get some judgments. Let them know that the very thing that you would think is not in their best interest to do is an option that they can't choose. Many times the person's going to say, well, no, no, I wasn't saying I wasn't going to file. And then you can go on with other options from there. With advising, emotions that come up are not feeling valued, not feeling heard, feeling minimized or discounted. Those are all feelings that can come up on the person that you're giving the advice to. And look for that in yourself. When somebody else is giving you advice, what are the feelings? What's coming up for you? The fifth one is using logic, arguing, or lecturing. So this is trying to convince someone to see things your way based on facts. Um, It was really painful for me when I heard this was one of the 12 things not to do. (laughs) I tend to be uh, in my left brain a lot, have pretty good left brain. And in my thinking, well, just give the person some facts. The answer is obvious. And I said last time that 50% of the the time that I think I have all the facts, uh, my advice won't work because I really didn't have all the facts. And think about this. If, if you have a partner, a romantic partner, even like a, a business partner, and things are starting to get a little emotional in a conversation, how does it work for you when you pull out the facts? Let me give you some facts. Let me give you some logic here. And the logic can be spot on. What normally happens? Things escalate, Right. When we are in our limbic system, which is usually where we're going, when voices start to get raised and emotions start bubbling up, the limbic system just doesn't care about what the facts are. And so it really can be adding fuel to a fire and it really can move a person away from making a change. Uh, Facts and logic are best left when the uh, defenses are not up, the emotions are not running high. Arguing, lecturing gives the the feeling of not being heard, uh, being controlled, being attacked, and uh, anger can come up, frustration can come up, resentment can come up. It's just typically not a way to help somebody change. And this can be even true to someone like me who is an educator and a speaker, trainer of sorts. I have a, um, it's a, a script of one of my parts that if I'm not talking, nobody, nothing's happening. Nobody's learning. Well, in a way, maybe that's true on a podcast, which this is the, the medium. But if you all were live in a class, I would have you doing more things, doing breakouts, talking to one another, doing dyads, because that's really effective learning. I was once told that talking is not teaching, and that's lecturing, which is kind of my go-to. 
Sixth item is criticizing, judging, or blaming. Basically, putting someone down or making them feel bad about themselves. Now, you already know that we can't make anybody feel anything, but we can shame them. We can minimize them. We can belittle them. We can criticize them in a way that can bring up emotions of, of uh, shame, of uh, being hurt, uh, anger, a real feeling of uh, vulnerability. Criticizing is a method I have used a lot in my past, thinking that will motivate people to, to make good change. And again, while it might be true, it's just not helpful. And usually the result of it is just piling on the shame that the person already feels about themselves. So it doesn't mean that there isn't a place for helping someone or pointing some things out. I know in IFS training, they will talk about your growing edge rather than criticize you for what you did here. Here's a growing edge. Here's something that can help even make you more effective. The seventh roadblock to change is praising, agreeing, or approving. All right. Now, when I heard this one, I'm like, give me a break. I can't praise somebody or agree with them or approve of what they're doing. In this context, when we do it in a way that gives someone positive feedback without really listening to what they have to say, has someone agreed with you when you knew that you hadn't said everything, that all the facts are not out there with what to agree? It can be almost like interrupting. Okay, great. Oh yeah, you're doing a, a good job. I really uh, approve of that course of action. When you yourself know that they really aren't fully interested in anything, they just want to kind of end the conversation. And praising when you think about it is a judgment. Oh, you're doing such a good job. Now it can also be condescending in how it's said, but it is judging their work as this is really great. Well, great by what standards? It could be a healthy, more helpful to say, how do you feel about the work that you've done? Have you ever been praised for something that you knew wasn't good? And I don't mean that you thought wasn't good from a shame perspective, because nothing is good enough when you're filled by sh with shame. But somebody's just given a praise out and it just falls hollow because you're like, mm, no, objectively, this wasn't necessarily good. And then you can set up resistance with the person you're praising them. They're going, no, <laughs> no, this wasn't good. Oh, yes, it was. You're kind of off to the races. The eighth one is name calling, labeling, or ridiculing. Okay. Using negative language to put someone down. Wow. We see that in spades in our political arenas today, don't we? Just outright shame, dispensing shame, which means you are bad at the core. Again, reminding us of the differences between guilt and shame. Guilt is, I did something wrong. I feel guilty about that. I feel guilty about what I just said. Feeling shame, you can feel shame about something that was done positive or are not done at all. Just systemic shame in I don't deserve, I'm not good enough. This is not guilt. This is shame. And shame comes from the very core of a person. And I'm not saying from the core of who you are. It's the, the core of the, of the wounding. That's how deep the trauma goes. And name calling, labeling, ridiculing, is a way to objectify people. So uh, I think it's the Arbing, Arbing, Arbinger Institute that has written a, written a number of books. And they talk about the difference between objectifying or humanizing someone. And the way we approach them and treat them are about 180 degrees apart. When we think of social media, the internet is full of 
objectification of people. Obviously, a person can feel humiliation, anger, hurt when they are labeled or ridiculed. Number nine is analyzing and interpreting or diagnosing. We've talked about this with NBC, a nonviolent communication, how part of that is learning to be objective as to what happened, playing back a video, not interpreting what it all meant. And this is something that is also in at the heart of the DSM-5 in uh, psychotherapy. Therapists are required to analyze and to diagnose. So this is trying to figure out what someone's thinking or feeling without really listening to them. It's uh, objectifying them. It's uh, treating somebody as an object rather than a person. And in IFS, the IFS um, practitioner therapist is, um, I won't, I won't want to say prohibited, but it's not part of the model. Analyzing, those are parts of yourself that you ask to step back. Those that want to interpret, those that want to diagnose, those that want to say, oh, I've got it. Here's what's going on within this person. I mean, we can even do that with the Enneagram, right? We can uh, diagnose people. Oh, you're a type one, you're a type two. You're this when the Enneagram best use is a self-discovery of your, of your type. Uh, the best teachers will say you never tell somebody else what they are. You can be sensitive to the energy of the person. Um, you can have a hunch and it may give you some insight, but it doesn't mean that that's that's right, or it's your job to tell them and diagnose them in that. Uh, so emotions here can be uh, feeling unheard, feeling criticized when you're diagnosed, uh, feeling less than, uh, feeling judged, uh, can really create a lot of insecurity. Number 10 is reassuring, sympathizing, or consoling. And this is another one I said, you're got to be kidding me. This is trying to make someone feel better without really listening to their problem, without giving them to the space to really tell you what's going on. It will be okay. They're there. It's all right. And sympathizing. Oh, I'm so sorry. And kind of cutting them off, you know, or trying to console them, which oftentimes is trying to take away their feeling. You know, patting somebody on the back actually can be a, a there, there, would you quit crying? And I know I'm being kind of rough here in a, in a place. That's not the intention at all, but it can be. It can be. Number 11, questioning, probing, interrogating. This is asking too many questions without really listening to the answers. This can set somebody back when it comes to changing, questioning or probing or interrogating the person can make them feel, put them right on the defensive. Again, emotions of insecurity, agitation, anger, violation, feeling violated, feeling vulnerable can all come up. And finally, <clears throat> withdrawing, distracting or humoring. I just won't talk about it. Uh, how about them bears? Or making a joke. It's all a way of avoiding the issue and trying to make light of it. And a person can end up feeling ignored, unimportant, dismissed, and minimized. These roadblock, <laughs> roadblocks can prevent a client from uh, listening really effectively because they're all focusing on the financial planner's agenda, the financial therapist's agenda, your agenda as a friend, rather than on the other person's needs. And they can really set the person back. They can bring up more defensiveness or, or resent, which can just block having a productive conversation. So you might be thinking, well, what's left? I was thinking that when I first heard these. Really listening, such as reflecting, summarizing, asking open-ended questions is what's left. Uh, getting curious. Tell me more about this. Uh, these skills are going to help you as a client feel heard, understood, and in a position to determine the best course of action for you and 
if you're the facilitator of change, it's going to help a person progress faster, much faster than if you do any of those 12 things. These roadblocks to effective communication, if you want to read more about them, came from Gordon's book, Parent Effectiveness Training, PET. And they were given to parents and they're applicable to us all. So if you want to be a better listener, it's really important to avoid these roadblocks. Focus on using active listening skills. And these skills are going to help you understand the speaker's perspective and help them to change internally. Thanks. I look forward to being with you next week. Thanks for joining me, Rick Kaler, for another episode of Financial Therapy. It's not just about the money. This is where I combine the nuts and bolts of financial advice with the emotions that drive making them. Remember, every financial behavior, whether it appears illogical to you or others, makes perfect sense when we understand the underlying beliefs, feelings, and thoughts. Sign up for my weekly blog at financialawakenings.com. I hope you'll join me again for our next episode.